to history at high noon, and welcome. Awfully nice to see this full house again. I tell you, I get so excited when people come, and you're all talking and having such a good time, and seeing old friends and having such fun, and uh, we have to put up chairs all the time. So there you go, so it's really good. So anyway, thank you very much for coming. Uh, History at High Noon is part of the Sturgis Area Arts Council programs. And also remember, I always tell you, thank the librarians, because they put these chairs up, they take them down, they make the coffee, and they give us a home. So we're grateful. So thank you to that. And so now this is the last program until next fall. And so Diane Hayes, who is here today, and is part of the committee, and I thank her much for her good help. Um, we'll start again in October. Not quite sure who's going to open it up yet, but, but we'll have a good program, we always do. So thank you for coming. And so it's just great fun to introduce James Forbes, who is the grandson of Jim and Doris. And uh, I'm going to let him introduce the rest of his family. So thank you, James. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, a couple months ago, Dodie asked me if I could do a presentation on the Big Bear Drive-In. Now, uh, <coughs> growing up at Forbes and being born in 1970, I never actually went to the Big Bear Drive-In. But growing up at Forbes, I heard nothing but about the Big Bear Drive-In my whole life. And I've always been infatuated and amazed of it. You know, it's just, you look back and it's just kind of the wonder years, you know. You think about a man, my grandpa, would actually go out and start a business concept and have a live bear on his property. I mean, you just don't see that in 2015. Businesses would never do anything like that, but they did in the 50s and 60s. You know, full effortists like Bugs Philipper, you know, would team up with Grandpa and, and come up with all these crazy people hanging and they would have, you know, I hear about the glass windows, the two-way mirrors and the voices. And so, uh, you know, I've just always been amazed by it. And as you can see, I've collected a lot of photos over the years. And, uh, you know, so I was really excited to have this opportunity. But the real people that can tell this story are the people that were there. And I can see a lot of faces in this room of people that had a big part of the Big Bear Drive-In. Uh, luckily, my dad, he's been going back and forth between Colorado and Sturgis. He happened to be here. So I asked if he would come and talk a little bit also today. So I would like to introduce my father, Jim Forbes, or Jimmy Forbes, back in Big Bear days, <laughs> and his wife, Jan Forbes. So Dad, can you come up and kind of bring us back? That's right. James has been hearing pictures about the Big Bear, or stories about the Big Bear for years, and uh, the crazy things that we did. Uh, I want to interrupt. So he did go to the Big Bear Drive-In. Oh, he true. just doesn't remember yeah, yeah, you it. <laughs> <laughs> you did, and you were coming back, and you have an allergy to cats. And when we brought you in to uh, uh, see Mom and Dad the first time, uh, you were just covered with spots. <laughs> they said, oh my goodness, this is our grandson. <laughs> It didn't get much better. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yes, you were there. <laughs> oh, fun. Uh, now, I made a mistake, and so Alva Rabadou corrected me on the timing, and so I think I'm about right on this as far as the timing of when we purchased the, the drive-in from Cliff Saunders. And I thought it was 56, but we think now it's 59. And they had it for 12 years. So about 59, and we think that it was sold either 70 or 71. So that's the years that we ran the drive-in. Prior to that, uh, Cliff and his family ran the drive-in that was the, what, quarter circle? Quarter circle S. Quarter circle S, right. right. Um, Dad worked at the post office full time at that time, but he was also taking out uh, course uh, by correspondence in commercial art. Jim, get yourself closer to the mic so people can oh, hear. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
He worked in the post office full time. Is that better? That's better. Stay there. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Uh, he was also taking a uh, correspondence course in commercial art. And so he's the one that came up with the name, the Big Bear. And he painted the first logo, the picture of the Big Bear holding the drumstick. Uh, and that went on the, uh, the big sign that we had over the drive-in. And then he started silk screening. He had learned how to do that. The mini signs that went up all over the Black Hills. And so that's how the name of the Big Bear really started. And we started putting signs up all over the, the Black Hills. Uh, silk screening. Dwight Moose, who's here uh, today, who worked for two summers there, uh, and his wife, Kathy, who was uh, Kathy Aga at that time, the daughter of Carl Aga, uh, was helping to build some of those signs and making these huge letters that we went up onto a uh, dry hill on the other side of uh, town, east side of town, and put these huge letters up, and we would, uh, uh, we had just a big bear that was probably, what, six feet high or something That's like that? Yeah, yeah we took those in. Now this was the uh, period of time that the small mom and pop businesses uh, existed, like James was talking about. It was before the, the chain and the franchises and all of this, and they were, they were really flourishing. And uh, as I remember, there was only one uh, franchise that was McDonald's, a very small one, in Rapid City. Now, the roasted chicken that we served was marinated in a special herb solution and breaded, and we marinated it overnight, uh, and then breaded them and put them... Uh, in the uh, ready to, to be able to work. Uh, and roasted chicken was brand new at that time. There was one, one other place that served roasted chicken, and that was Daisy Dell. You know, you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Daisy Dell, yeah. Very nice people, another mom and pop business. And they were very gracious in uh, letting us come down and learn more about the business, because none of us were restaurant people at all. We just decided to tackle it. <laughs> Uh, and we learned more about uh, the serving of the chicken and various things like that. <clears throat> Our goal from the very start was to serve the very best roasted chicken and hamburgers in the Black Hills. And we felt that the best form of advertising was word of mouth. Our customers talking to other customers, and we found out that was true. We did do some advertising in the newspapers and on uh, radio. At first, the radio station that was the larger in the area was in Deadwood, and I did go to Deadwood weekly to put an ad on. Uh, and I always closed the ad with the words, and remember, folks, it's always cooler in the canyon. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. This was the time before, I don't know if there even was central uh, air conditioning at that time. There might have been, but we there certainly was. didn't have it. Was there? Okay, there was. Okay. We didn't have it. <laughs> and a lot of people didn't. But uh, people would come out and they just wanted to cool off in the, uh, in the canyon and have a good meal and enjoy being outdoors. And so we had just the normal, uh, no dining room, car hop type of, of business. And uh, they had some picnic tables, as you can see, under the patio where they could uh, have their, their meal outside or sit in their cars. And as business grew, it was just getting so packed in there. I'm sure when Dwight was there, there were some Sundays that we had cars uh, double park one behind the other, so you'd have to move a car in order to be able to get the other person out. It really did take out in business. We were, we were blessed in that. When we started, as I said, we had just the uh, outside car up uh, type of business, and so we knew that it was very important that we find the very best car hops that we could find. And I guess I'm prejudiced, but I think we did sign some of the best car hops in the Black Hills. Uh, really some great gals that uh, got it out fast, and uh, they acted professionally, and they worked hard. 
and the wages weren't very high at that time, but they uh, they got good tips at, at, at Big Bear. Within the years of business, we, we doubled in the first year the amount of business that we got. Then in 1961, I think, we decided to build an indoor dining room. Uh, people would come and ask, that, uh, could we have a, a reunion, could we have a, a party at the Big Bear, but we don't have a place. So we started building the inside dining room. One of Dad's friends, as James said, was Bugs Philip or Donald, a uh, taxidermist. And at that time, at least this is what Dad told me, you know, Bugs is getting up in years, and uh, he's really not wanting to work that hard right now with making all those uh, animal heads and various kinds of things that he'd done for years. I said, what's he going to do, Dad? Well, he's thinking he's going to make some human heads. <laughs> yeah, he's going to make some human heads. And I said, well, how's he going to do that? Well, he said he's uh, planning on going down to the barber shops and the beauty parlors and getting some hair. And he thinks he's going to find a place where he can find some eyes that look pretty human. <laughs> What's he, how's he going to make them? Well, he's going to use uh, deer skin, tan deer skin, and then he'll make it look like a person. Well, what kind of person is he going to make? Well, Wild Bill, of course, Poker Alice, <laughs> a few others. He likes a few bear heads occasionally, too. And so we got some of these because uh, he was a good friend with Dad, and they were in the drive-in. They also were, remember, in uh, the number 10 saloon in, uh, in Deadwood. But uh, we really started having fun with those heads. And uh, this is when not only the business picked up, but I started having a lot of fun, and I think some of the other people did too. Uh, we had, at that time, Poker Alice and Wild Bill, and we had the big bear head that was up there, but we also had a bear skin that would hang down from the ceiling with the paws up and the head down. And we had a lot of fun with this. This was when Dwight was, was with me, and uh, one of us would be broasting, and frequently the other person, if there was a break in business that wasn't too busy, uh, would have the heads talking. Uh, <laughs> I had the idea, and I think this was before you came, uh, we, I put speakers underneath all the heads. <laughs> and we put a, a mirror in the dining room at a place that looked rather appropriate, but it was really one of the mirrors where you could see through. And so I could look through, and I could see the people out there, but they couldn't see me. And so then I just started off by, I was in, uh, theatrical arts as Kathy was and I thought well I'm just going to make use of this and have some fun with people and so I started changing my voice from the bear's voice or Wild Bill Hickok or Poker Alice various names and we just started I just started chatting with them first and having fun with people out in the dining room and they started laughing about it uh, so much that the idea of our customers said uh, well, they said to mom and dad, and they mentioned it to me too, could we have some parties up there? Uh, can we have parties to bring up friends or reunions and this sort of thing? Well, I said, I, I guess we could. We we'll just have to see how that's going to work. So as it worked, they would call us ahead of time, and they would uh, say, we're going to bring up a party of uh, 30, 40 people, whatever it was, and uh, we want to have Fred or Charlie or something on what we called the hot seat. And we had a, a, a long line where you could seat about 20 people on the uh, west side, I guess it was, or east side of the dining room. And then a padded bench on the other side that was built in. And the, the way it would work is people would come in, it was all reserved, and uh, we were getting ready to serve them and everyone knew in this group what was going to happen, except for the people who were going to be on the hot seat. <laughs> and so we'd come in from the the dining or from the, the kitchen, and we'd say, "Well, now it's about ready for uh, for the meal to be served. Uh, 
but it's just going to be a few minutes. Maybe you want to step up and stretch your legs a little bit, and we'll bring the food in. Well, everyone said, yeah, let's, let's stand up, and we'll just kind of move around here a little bit. And this was my cue. So then, as the food was just coming out, and the person on the hot seat, of course, didn't know anything about this, this guy would, let's say Charlie, was going to sit down. Everyone else knew what's going to happen. So Charlie is starting to sit down, and I'm on the microphone. <laughs> People would look around, and they were trying to not laugh. And, you know, he's looking embarrassed. <laughs> what's going on? Oh, well, come on, let's sit down, folks. <laughs> oh, he did that twice. And by that time, everybody's just about cracking up. And uh, then it uh, comes off from the head of Wild Bill. Hey there, mister. This is the ghost of Wild Bill Hickok. I'm buried underneath that uh, bench you're sitting on. <laughs> Can you just scoot over? You're sitting on my gun belt buckle. <laughs> We just had a ball doing that sort of thing. Did you and, scoot over? Yeah, he did good. <laughs> As everybody was just laughing and, and just could hardly control their laughter. But the business started growing and uh, we just had more and more fun with it. One other experience that uh, is... Is Carol wandering? I guess not. Uh, anyway, it was... Uh, uh, kind of a slow day, and Carol had uh, come out for lunch with her daughter Janine, and they were uh, just, uh, Janine was probably about five, I think, at that time, at least by what she looked like, and Carol was still eating, and they were sitting over in this table right next to this uh, area that had the, the bear's head, just about at Janine's level, and she had a drumstick in her hand. And she was standing there looking at this bear, and I just couldn't resist. I was looking through, and I said, All right, I'm glad you just got here in time. Now, you won't remember probably all of it, but you've heard about it. <coughs> the bear? Remind me. Oh, okay, all right. I was really little. Yeah, you were five, four, something like that. Anyway, you and your mom were having uh, dinner. It, uh, Carol was sitting there finishing her meal, and you were pretty much up and moving around. You had your <coughs> drumstick in your hand. And you were standing right by this bear. Uh, you can look at the picture that was hanging down from the wall by its feet with its head right about your level. And just about the time you had this drumstick and you were about ready to take a bite of it, I said, oh. Hey, little girl, that looked like a good piece of chicken. <laughs> Your eyes got big. <laughs> and then I growled again, oh. Hey, little girl, can I have a bite of that chicken? Can <laughs> I give you one? And you waved that drumstick around and you said, No, you can't have it. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, little girl, I just want one little bite. <laughs> and you took that drumstick and you hit the bear on the head. <laughs> and I growled again. <laughs> and you ran out the door <laughs> with your mother chasing you. <laughs> Halfway across the parking lot, I had to ask all kind of forgiveness. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things that happened. I'm glad you walked in. You walked in right at the right time. Yeah. Oh, really? Really? <laughs> uh, then we had the uh, the experience with the bears, and uh, as James said, we brought a, a real bear the big bear drive-in. And I think they got the first bear, and anyone knows otherwise, correct me, the old Hill City Zoo had a bear. And they were closing out and needed to have something to do with the bear, and we heard about it. And so 
mom or dad or somebody went up and picked up a uh, bear that we called Honey Bear. Uh, and that was what we had in front of the drive-in. Dad made a, a big enclosure uh, to keep the bear in, and a little house in there, and the tree, and you'll see the pictures up there of Honey Bear. And <coughs> it was fun because people liked to go out and uh, look at the bears and uh, see them. And it really went pretty good. Uh, Mom said that Honey Bear really shouldn't have been called Honey Bear, she should have been called Ice Cream, because she liked ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we had a lot of ice cream there. And so, uh, Honey Bear got a lot of ice cream, but she really liked ice cream, and ice cream cones. And the one experience that, that happened that was dangerous and funny all at the same time, dangerous because uh, it did happen, but uh, fortunately it wasn't a serious accident. Uh, Jody Jarvis, senior, the barber, uh, was out for, for dinner, and it was evening, and it was a hot evening, so Joe had walked from the, the uh, drive-in, or his car, and, yeah, I'd been in the din din dining room by that time, uh, and he was looking at Honey Bear. Well, I'd been real busy, and the fence had started to sag a little bit, and he had an ice cream cone in his hand. <laughs> And Honey Bear was looking at Joe, and Joe was looking at Honey Bear, and he was just kind of looking over the top there a little bit. And Honey Bear reached out his paw, grabbed the ice cream cone, jerked it his way, Joe dumped backwards, and then Honey Bear, as it was coming down, it wasn't trying to do anything harmful to him, but his claw caught Joe's belt, busted it, Joe was grabbing for his pants <laughs> and backing up. <laughs> and Honey Bear had the ice cream going. <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't cut Joe or anything. <laughs> uh, that was the point that uh, uh, Mom and Dad were out there apologizing like mad, and uh, uh, we had to rebuild the fence uh, much higher. And Honey Bear had really gotten too big at that point, so we finally had to uh, get rid of Honey Bear. I don't quite know where they, they took her, probably to another zoo or something. Uh, so Honey Bear was gone then. And then Joe Blow, and his picture's up here too, and uh, uh, Alvarado, who know him quite well. And Dad went to, I think it was Idaho, correct me if I'm wrong now, uh, to get two twin bears. And then we had the twin bears, and when I got it in the fall, and so it was winter when these little babies, just tiny little babies, uh, came to the house. I was gone, and so I heard all of these stories. But they were just like babies. They were very rambunctious, and it was cold, so they had to keep them in the house. <laughs> so they had two little bears running around in their house. <laughs> and Dad was working the post office, and uh, Mom was up at the house most of the time. And she said, those were just like little kids. She said they'd run around, and if they started getting into trouble, and I'd try to scoot them out into another room so they weren't tearing stuff up, they'd crawl underneath the bed, and this is when you had uh, springs that were exposed, and she was trying to get them out from underneath their bed, and their paws were into the springs. <laughs> so they kept those for, I think, about two years, and finally uh, they got too big, too, and we went out of the, out of the bear business. But... Uh, they went to Albuquerque Zoo. That's right. Okay. Flew them we we down to the Albuquerque Zoo because they were in good shape too, eating ice cream all the time. Yeah. Uh, anyway, then my creativity, or craziness, some people would call it, got the better of me. And I decided, uh, without Mother knowing, that I was going to put one of the heads in the, uh, the men's room. Uh, and Bugs had created a head that was very alluring, uh, red as I remember. And Dad had it over the house, and I thought, oh, what can I do with that? So I just decided on my own, I'm going to put it in the, the bathroom, and we would have a mirror, that type of mirror, uh, and a light behind it, and the heads in the box. And so about the time the guy... I could see him through the, the mirror. He was walking into the, uh, the, it was the men's room, but he'd walk into the men's room, 
And I thought, well, now just about this time, I'm going to turn the light on. And when I turned the light on, I said, oh, my goodness, my goodness, what are you doing in the ladies' room? <laughs> I did that twice before Mother knew that I had done it. <laughs> and she said, Jim, that's the end of <laughs> any heads in the diner in the bathroom. <laughs> and the heads left the bathroom. <laughs> anyway, it, uh, it was a lot of, of fun years. Okay, a little bit more because I want to have experiences that you can share. In 1960, I believe, we built a miniature golf course, uh, and Dwight will remember that uh, there was also a uh, uh, badminton set out there for customers, and especially kids. It was short-lived, really, because uh, even after doing all of this work, this was when the 62 flood came and washed out the, the road, and so the, the Bad men said, and all that went down the down the area. Uh, <clears throat> the white was working in the drive-in when the uh, when the flood did come, and I was uh, heading to uh, California to get a teaching job with um, my friend Bill Wire. But uh, he was there during that that period of time, and was a tremendous help to my mom and dad during the, the time of the, the big flood. Um, I think I'm about running down here. Just a couple more things to say. Uh, anyway, it was a great year and a great time, and I think we had some of the best employees uh, available. Irene worked there, Dwight worked there. Any others that worked at the drive-in? Yes. Okay. Oh, really? Okay, great. Good, good. Yeah. I'm going to uh, ask then if any of you, not only if you have any questions, but uh, more importantly, do you have an experience that you'd like to share of what went on in the driving? Would you? Please. Jimmy, I'm, I'm Helen Howe. Yeah. Oh, okay. And sure. I and my sister. Of course, sisters, I remember you yeah, there. And we all worked there. But I don't know if you remember, but I think it was the summer of 59. You decided, it was you, decided that we would stay open uh, all night when the uh, uh, Days of 76 Day was 76. going on. Yeah. And you and I worked inside. Uh -huh. And Judy Keegan, who became my sister-in-law, okay. she was the car hop. Because uh -huh. she worked there too. I never worked so hard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> we had so many people, we just couldn't get to them all. And it's the night I remember that we were so busy, we sent the hamburger out and forgot to put the hamburger bun in the <laughs> sandwich, the meat in it. The guy sent it back, too, you know. <laughs> but I always remember that. that we, I think we stayed open until about 4 in the morning that night. Oh, yeah. And yeah. It, it was a good idea because we were busy. <laughs> yeah, great, good. Do I? you want to share what happened when we went up to Deadwood? Oh. Well, Jim mentioned his penchant for creativity, <laughs> and he decided that during the days of 76 that we sh probably should beef up the advertising because they, they weren't quite satisfied with the amount of business that we were getting. And we, st we were staying over all night, just as you related. So he made up a bunch of balloons with uh, uh, specials in them, like a Coke for five cents, or an ice cream cone, a, a double ice cream cone for a nickel, uh, and a, a bunch of things like that. And then we were going to distribute these uh, amongst the crowd uh, in the, at the night of Days of 76. So we talked about how we were going to distribute them, and we finally decided that the best thing we could do is if we could get up above the street, the crowd, and just throw them out. People would pick them up, and then on their way back uh, to Sturgis or wherever, they might stop in, and we'd pick up a little business. 
So we climb up on top of, uh, I don't even remember what building it was. It was from the old Bodega, it, and we climbed up on those ladders we weren't supposed to be on. <laughs> so we climb up the ladders in the back, and we're up on top of the building looking over the parapet wall, and we've got these things, and we're throwing them out. And some lady comes out, and she looks up there, and she hollers, you guys get down off there. We paid no attention to her. We just kept right on throwing them. She hollers at us again. You guys get down off there. I'm going to call the police. We are the police, lady. <laughs> she went back in the house. We're back in her business, whichever it was. And we kept right on. Then we got to thinking, maybe she would call the police. So we, we probably better get out of there. So we... We came down and we moved down the street away, so climbed back up and back, back until we got rid of all the balloons we had. So that was one of our experiences. Another one, if I take a minute, Jim, and I'll please, tell you about please. Sir Percival the Coyote. Oh, yeah. Jim was telling about the talking heads, and one of the heads, we don't have a picture of it, but it was a coyote. And it was right up above the door that you went in to the, uh, the dining room. And Sir Percival could talk. So we would have the car hops, if, if there was a family that had little kids, the car hops would try to get the name of at least one of the kids. And then they would come and they would tell Jim or I, whichever one was supposed to be Sir Percival, that, uh, and we'll say that the kid's name was Jam. So we'd look through the two-way mirror and we'd watch until the family got settled down and then We'd say, Jan, how you doing? <laughs> the little kid would look around. <laughs> and we'd set up a dialogue. And, it, and finally, why we, you know, they'd say, well, where's that coming from? Or who is that? Well, this is Sir Percival, the talking coyote. <laughs> and we'd talk in an English dialect. I can't do it anymore. And I never was real good at the English dialect, but Jim was very good at, at mimicking, and he taught me the, the, key, the key phrases, and I could do it then when, when I was 50 pounds lighter and, and uh, better at ventriloquism. Yeah. But anyway, Sir Percival was, uh, he, he was a hit with, with the little kids, just as the bear was with, with you. Uh, they would... They would set, and, they, and of course you could get a dialogue going, you know, because you, two or three questions, and you could kind of get a feel for, for uh, what would be of interest to them. And so then we'd ask them, you know, had they been to Deadwood? If no, where are they going to go? And had they been, had they been to Mount Rushmore? And usually, if they were from out of state, yeah, they'd been to Rushmore, or they were going. And so then we would tell them, and we would tell them to be careful. You know, now George Washington, you've got to watch out for him <laughs> when, you're, when you're down there. And it, nowadays we'd be arrested <laughs> for, for some of the things that we did. But, but those were fun times. So I worked there the summer of 61 and 62. And as Jim said, the flood was in 62. It was June 15th, which was a Friday that year. And started raining early in the morning and I was painting, Forces had built on to the, to the living quarters in between 61 and 62. So when I went back to work after I got out of uh, school that spring, why the, the inside hadn't been painted yet. And Jim wasn't there so I needed to wait for him to get there before we could go back into the sign business uh, that he alluded to early, putting up the signs that big as we called him, Big Jim, made. So Doris said, well, if you want to do the painting, you paint the inside, why, you could do that until, of course, I'd go to work about 4 o'clock roasting chicken. So I was painting away, and I'm watching, and I thought, man, it's raining pretty hard out there. And it kept on raining, and it rained all day. And about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I decided, this is not good. Because I could look out in the parking lot between the drive-in and McDermott's, and there wasn't anything else there from that time. You could look right over to McDermott's house, and the water out in the parking lot was about, about three, four inches deep. So I put my painting, my paint away, and I went in and told Doris, I said, Doris, this is not good. I, I think we're going to be in trouble. Yeah, she kind of thought so too, so she told the, 
We waited until about 5 o'clock, and of course the water just kept getting deeper and deeper. But it wasn't in the building yet, but it was swirling around outside. So she decided that probably she'd tell the car ops they could go home, because we, we weren't going to have that much business, even though it was a Friday night, which was one of our biggest nights. Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday were, were by far our, our biggest clientele nights. So she sent most of the car hops home, but we kept three or four, three or four of the girls, because we figured we'd have some business. But by about 5, 30 or 6, the water was up about 18 inches on the side <coughs> of the building. And in the living room of the living quarters, there was a big picture window. And it looked out to the west. And the, the water was getting deeper and deeper in there, and I thought, we're in a lot of trouble. So I thought, I'm going to suggest to Doris we shut this operation down. Because, and Jim was down in, Jim Sr., Big Jim, he was down working at the post office. So he, was, he wasn't there yet. And Doris said, yeah, I think maybe we, we should close. Well, closing, by then the water's up. Eventually it got up, so it was up, it was up against that picture window and it was about this deep on the, on the window. You could look out the window and there was water, this much of it was water. It was up about, about three feet on the west wall of the building. So then our concern came, the building sat on a concrete slab. Was it going to hold or not? Well. We couldn't go outside because if we did, I mean the water was it was the current was just ripping down to the to the east. So our choices were to stay in there and hope that it held. Finally it quit raining about, I don't know, nine, nine thirty, ten o'clock, I suppose. And part of the problem was there were two two entrances off Highway 14A that came into the drive in. And the, the westmost one of those was acting just like a dam. And so the water was coming down the ditch, and then of course it couldn't get the culvert. There was no way the culvert could hold it. And so it would swirl right in to the parking lot of the drive-in. And so then it would start spinning like this, coming coming around. And then it would go down over, and it actually washed out the eastmost entrance to the drive-in that night as it was washing down through there. But when we finally, it, it saw down to the Nuffa, then the three girls that had stayed, how are they going to get out of here? Because we knew the road was washed out. Doris had called Bob Short to come up and bring his caterpillar up, because we thought if we could tear those entrances out to the drive-in, we could get that water out. Well, by the time he got there, the damage was done. We had water. The water was, it was right up to the plug-ins. So I had gone and shot all the electricity off. And we had a couple of lanterns that we had for light. And the, t the telephone worked. So Doris could call, but nobody could, the, those three girls that had stayed, their boyfriends were going to come and get them when they got off work. Well, the boyfriends, there was no way in the world they could get there because the road was washed out between Sturgis and the drive-in. So the National Guard came out. And they picked up those three people, and they offered to take Doris and I too. But we went up to Mary Meyer worked at the drive-in. She ran the uh, the uh, grill, and and she was there. And so her husband, she called her husband, and he came down uh, with his pickup, and we all, Mary and Doris and I, sloshed through the water out onto the highway. And Doris and I went up and stayed overnight with Myers. And the next day, Hori Doris said, well, the next morning, she said, well, there's no point in putting it off. We've got to go down and see how bad it is, even if the building is there or not. And I said, ah, oh, the building will be there because the water was going down when we left. And so if it was going to push it off the slab, it would have done it uh, when it was deep. You know, I, I said, it'll be there. Well, it was, but there was silt about this deep in everything, the entire building. But the good news was Jim, Jim had by then, he went up to 
where now it'd be exit 17 and up to Deadwood and down that way. And he came down and he took a sample of water from the well to have it tested to make sure that the, uh, the water hadn't gotten polluted. And I don't know how he got it tested because the next day was Saturday. So I don't know how he got it done, but he did. And Doris called uh, anybody, anybody that worked there that wanted to come up and help clean up. Could, but they didn't have to. And most of the car hops showed up, but they had to go up to Deadwood and up, I mean, up to what's now exit 17, and then up to Deadwood and then down. But most of them showed up by mid-morning. And Tuesday, we were back in business. <laughs> Bob Short came up and rebuilt the driveways and hauled gravel in. And Mary's husband brought his tractor with a blade on it and, and retrieved as much of the gravel as he could and pulled it back in. And there was a lot of, a lot of work yet to be done that, in fact, it took the rest of the summer to get the drive in, to get everything back. We scratched the golf course because it, it went down Garibuda Creek. <laughs> the golf course was gone, the badminton court was gone, all of that stuff was gone. But the building itself, uh, it was pretty well built because that's a lot of pressure when you have water that deep. And because that was a long wall that, that ran along the west side. And yet, I don't know what the engineering would be to compute the amount of pressure that was against that building. But I do know that if you pushed against the glass, you could feel the water pushing back. Because I did that. Because I wanted to see if that picture window was going to hold. And so I push against it, and I could feel it. If I let up on it, I could feel the water pushing, pushing back against it. I thought, well, it's either going to hold or it's not. And I'm not going to do about it either way. So anyway, that was that was an experience. That's the only flood I've ever been through. I don't want to ever go through another one. <laughs> Thank you. I agree. Thanks, Dwight. Thank you. Yeah. Another uh, comment that somebody has? Al? I didn't. I didn't, I didn't work at the drive-in, but my wife did. And uh, we just lived up the road a little bit at a little campground, a little bit of campground. We had just been married, but... You can tell uh, I the story of uh, the Indian? You can tell the story of the Indian? Good. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, you taught me good things. Okay. <laughs> uh, all those gals that worked up there, they were all pretty close. They, they had a lot of fun. Uh, the Hardys and Pharrell the Getz and Arfield and all of them. They were a real close bunch. And, and uh, we got word one day that the gals, the counter hops, were going to go up to Deerfield Lake and camp out. And I think this was during the week, if I'm not mistaken, because the weekends were busy. So Art Peel and I got together, and my wife Irene, and we thought, you know, we're going to have to pull a little trick on them counter hops. So Forbes had a wooden Indian up there. I don't paper know mache, you actually. remember the wooden Indian? Yeah, paper mache. And, uh, so we decided we were going to get that wooden Indian. We didn't tell Jim and Doris, but <laughs> we are going to steal the Indian. So I had a car that didn't have a real big trunk. So we stuck this Indian in the trunk with his head sticking out. <laughs> and we took off up through Hill City and we turned on the Deerfield Lake Road and it was a gravel road at that time. Not a real good road, it had been kind of raining. And and of course, I was in, I worked for the state for $221 a month, so I didn't have a little money, a lot of money, and my tires were terrible. And naturally, I had a sp uh, flat tire. I thought, oh, great. So we stopped, and of course, the, the spare tire was in the trunk, so we opened the trunk, <laughs> drugged the dead Indian, and naturally, I mean, the wooden Indian, and we were laying him on the ground, and here comes a car, right? <laughs> <laughs> we were handling this Indian trying to get him on the ground. And they kind of drove by slowly looking at us. <laughs> so we, we got, got the tire fixed and, and uh, changed. And we had to look for their tent, the tar house tent. 
So we found the tent, we went back to the car, and we got, we had to be real quiet, and we stuck that Indian, or stood him up in front of the tent, <laughs> the flap, the tent flap, and then we started making strange noises in the, <laughs> on the back side of the tent so that they would go out the front to see what it was. And of course, they did, and it worked out pretty good. <laughs> there was this big old Indian standing in front of the tent. <laughs> and they let out a few screams. They, I think they figured out who did it right away. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but we had to take the Indian back before it got found that it was gone. Right, right. Or getting gold. soaked with water. It was paper mache. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we didn't want to do it, no, we took it. <laughs> had a lot of good good times there. I, just as a little side note, uh, I, I was actually involved with the, the old Quarter Circle S for quite a while before Jim and Doris had it. And the reason Jim and Doris bought the deal was uh, Mabel Sanders was the county nurse. And she went all over the county and uh, Cliff Sanders was a carpenter and he liked to build houses and, and then they were running this drive-in. And Sylvia, their oldest daughter, would help. And she didn't really like that job too well. So when um, Cliff says, well, I'm a carpenter, we're going to develop the Valhalla subdivision up there, which is what they did. And then that's the reason they got out of the driving business. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's about all. I guess I could tell more, but I better not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dad built that when I was just a little kid out of paper mache. He was in our basement, like this. Lightfoot. Yeah, lightfoot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It looked like a wood medium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Paper mache, really, but he had it painted. He was almost falling apart at the time. I'm sure he must have been. Especially the way that road was, I ask <laughs> There's one like that. Well, I just want to make it. I think my voice is playing loud enough. That is good. I just want to make one, one statement. That was probably one of my first jobs, you know, other than a paper route. Your parents were the nicest people I think I ever worked for. They were sweet to everyone. They were good to all those car hops and people that were there. They were special. It was really like family, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, we felt like family with, with all of the gals. Well, I don't really have a story to tell. I was uh, Nancy. This is Nancy Peterson Carpenter, and I was Shirley Cooper, um, Marge and Hank's youngest daughter. Sure, yeah. So I worked there in 1969 and 1970 as a car hop, and I can definitely uh, agree with the comment that that was absolutely, hands down, my favorite job. Mm. I just loved it. And we had such a bond, all of us that were working together. It was just like it was one big happy family, and we just oh we just so connected and had such a good time. And so your mom and dad did a really good job. Yeah, yeah. There was no problem finding people to work. They were yeah. usually waiting in line. Am I on? No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was my first job too, and I started out as a dishwasher, and I worked in the kitchen, and I'm just looking at the menu. But I worked on the side that, you know, we did the ice cream and the shakes and the, and then eventually I was the steak cooker and the girl. Yeah. So that was, um, I think it was uh, 68 maybe when I started washing dishes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And my cop finger worked with us, and Bob Davis was the roaster boy. That's what I thought. Bob. Yes, yeah. and Craig Johnson. At yes. Mom's funeral, Bob was down there and sharing some experience. Yeah. Yeah. And Craig Johnson uh, was also a roaster. Marty Megan. Marty Megan. Yeah. And we all um, we all were taught to prepare for the rush. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And we, we did need to order some extra chicken because the motorcycle rally was coming up. <laughs> so that was kind of a small crowd back then. <laughs> in, the, 
the old uh, in that Sturgis book. I don't know if you brought it, James. Oh, okay. Anyway, that that was fun. Wasn't it um, Ray Ritchie who uh, ran the radio station in Sturgis? Yeah. 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 That's right. Okay. We had a big chicken eating contest. <laughs> and I can't remember the number because in the Sturgis book, that I'm sure is in the library, I don't have a copy of it now, uh, it shows a picture of Ray Ritchie uh, standing next to some other person who is the battler to try to say who was going to eat the most chicken. But they had an amazing amount of chicken that went down them. And <laughs> we advertised for quite a while we were going to have a chicken eating contest and whoever wins uh, would win something. I don't think it would have been a tub of chicken. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was another fun What actually happened to the building and stuff? How did it end up? Uh, the, in, I think it was uh, 69 or 70 that we sold it. Uh, the year 70 or 71. 70 or 71, yes. you think so? No, it was later than that because my sisters worked there in 72. Like, 72? No, 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 you're right, you're right. No, you're right. They, no. Sold. It was, yeah. they were younger. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah, I think that's about right. Uh, I think that Dad uh, retired from the post office and um, at that point they wanted to travel with us. It had to be after the summer of 1970, though, because when I was pregnant, pregnant with Teresa, uh -huh. I had a terrible craving for those fried sit rolls. Oh. <laughs> and I think it was fate, because look who she married. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah. We, we got those rolls and we would uh, heat them up, stick them uh, in the hot grease, and then poke honey down into them. Oh, they were all nice. And butter. And butter. Yeah. Yeah, that was fine. Anyway, uh, in answer to your question, the first year we sold to uh, another couple, as I remember, uh, and they didn't even get a chance to run the first year because they had put heat tape, as we found out, uh, between the drive-in into their trailer house. They were living in the trailer house, stood in the drive-in in that time. And they had heat tape between, and evidently the heat tape somehow uh, got things going on fire and the fire spread to the drive-in and so it just went up in flames. Yeah. Um, I'm Deanne Bertolotto. Oh, okay. 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 I was a Bertolotto and um, anyway I worked there in 62 and um, I don't think it's on. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you just got to hold it real close. No, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, I'm Deanne Bertolotto, and I was, and I worked there in 62. Try that. Try, Try that. that. Okay. I worked there in That's 60. Better. There. I worked there in 62, and um, I don't. I wasn't around when I think maybe I was called off when the flood happened, but um, I wasn't up there during that time for some reason. Um, and it was, and and they were were wonderful to work for your parents. They were not your parents, but yeah, your parents. Yeah, yeah, your parents. Okay. Um, but they were they were just really wonderful. And it was like some of the others said, like a family. And everybody, you know, I was a car hog and worked in the dining room and it was super super busy at times. Oh yeah, it's crazy. I remember doing a few dishes too, and nickels and cones and things like that. Oh, yeah. And then it's spare time, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it was fun. I mean, there was so many people that stopped by. It was just really a lot of fun, and um, I really enjoyed it. I lived in the country, used to town, so oh, yeah. you know it wasn't. I, st I was staying at town in town at that time, yeah. but that was really fun. But how many other car hops are here that work there? Somewhere inside. Yeah. Yeah. Before everybody goes today, is there any way I could get a picture of all the people that work there? To add to my collection, I just think that'd be really yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Does somebody else have their hand up? I, I just oh. had a few. Good. Thanks. Hi, I'm Janine Walker, and I didn't actually work there, but I have many fond memories because I ate a lot of chicken and ice cream there. <laughs> and my sisters worked there, 
And they love, they, I called my sister Susan this morning, she lives in Las Vegas, and she said, just to say that Jim and Doris Forbes were the very best bosses anybody could have ever had. They were, it was like family. And you know how sometimes buildings have a spirit when you walk in, it's not like just a restaurant, it's like, so we used to go there and eat a lot with my grandparents and over the years. Um, anyway, um, I asked Susan to share a story that was fond to her, and of course there was always a lot of practical joking going on up there. And the one that she shared, I guess I can say their names, it's not like it's incriminating, but Barbara Bashan, who was a car, was a waitress up there. And this was the 70s, so wigs were becoming very vogue and people were wearing wigs. And they had a half door between the kitchen and the dining room and Barbara had a whole tray full of drinks. And as she's going out the door, John James used um, chicken tongs to pull her wig off. <laughs> yeah, so she couldn't do anything. She had to walk through to the dining room to set this tray down, and so of course they thought that was pretty funny. But I also remember too that it was uh, Marty Mangan and Paul Buchanan, and they they carpooled up there. Well, they didn't really carpool. Those were, Paul had a car, and everybody had to pay 25 cents to get a ride up there, right? So my sister Susan and Patty and Kathy Davis and Peggy Davis, and so. They'd kind of stop in the middle of Spruce Street and everybody come out of their houses to get in the car. But Paul had to have his 25 cents before he'd take off. Well, Susan didn't have her 25 cents that day. She goes, Paul, I'll give it to you when you get my tips. He goes, nope, that's not how the deal works. And so she had to borrow 25 cents from my sister Patty before Paul would take them to work. <laughs> and I don't know why I think that they were still working there in 72 because I remember when the 72 flood was happening and everybody got to come home early because I'm pretty sure your mother didn't want to re-experience that again. But so maybe I do have my dates wrong, but it seems like they were wrong. Okay, maybe they were work, maybe they were working at the golf course or something. That's probably what it was. And anyway, um, yeah. So I I had fond memories, and I do remember the little bears out in the front in the cage. I loved them. Yes. Anyway, it was a wonderful place. Linda Wells and I grew up in Deadwood and now I understand the power of advertising because I knew that it was cooler in the canyon <laughs> and as a little girl I kept begging because we didn't have air conditioning to go to the Big Bear because it was cooler in the canyon. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you remember, I was one of the Howes, and oh, we yeah. okay. worked for you quite a bit, and... Um, Your first name is? Leona. Leona, yeah, okay. I worked inside. I'm not, That's right. I yeah. wasn't then, nor am I now. I think I need to spend the uh, car hop type. But anyway, um, I got rheumatic fever in 1960 while I was working there, and your dad saved my life by sending me home um, and telling me I'm not to work that shift, and the next day I ended up in the hospital for three months. But uh, anyway, I don't know if you recall, and I meant to bring it today. I still have a little bear that you guys gave me with a sign around the neck that said, Little Bear from Big Bear. <laughs> and you personally brought me a um, Listerine bottle with dead dandelions in it. <laughs> <laughs> what a charmer. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I think I finally threw that away a couple years ago. But I do still have there. So, um, and I'm going to make a pitch for History Day. Can I put you down for a booth at History Day on June 20th to bring your exhibit down to the armory? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. The Historical Society yeah, is putting on History here, Day. I'm sure James will bring it down. Yeah, I'll probably be here. Okay, I'll stop and talk to you That's after. Good. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Yeah, yeah. I thought I recognized you. Bob was your dad, right? Yes. Yeah, sure. Senility is setting in. I was thinking one o'clock. You know, noon at library at one o'clock. Yeah. 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 Whenever I think of your dad, I always think of scouts, and of course. Yeah, Stanley was going to be here today. Too, yeah. But the yeah. paper said Jim and Doris's grandson. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, whenever I think of uh, Scouts, so I think of your, your yeah, dad and yeah, Stan and, and Robbie that were yeah. in Scouts so much with him. One more. Well, my name is Pam Conway, and I worked there for two years in high school, and my boyfriend was Bob Ham, Doc Ham's son, oh, sure. and he would take me up there and bring me home, and 
and uh, or my dad. But I have so many fond memories of you at Fort Meade and uh, your mom and your dad and getting my hands in the trap in the that was covered, you know, the chicken. Yeah. But to this day, I don't think I've ever had a roasted chicken that I thought matched what we got there. We're the best. So I think somebody, if anybody's sitting here and wants to do that, it would make a buttload of money. <laughs> Just very quickly, Dad was almost fanatic about the grease. He said there are too many <coughs> greasy spoon restaurants. And so he, we had a, a thing that we would put uh, filtered sand that we bought from the company underneath it and then a, a piece of paper. And we, every night, drained the grease through the, uh, the, uh, the water. Uh, I only had one mistake where I let the grease out on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> the steak menu there. Two, three ninety-five for T-Bone, and I saw in today's paper that T-Bone's nine ninety-nine. Yeah, for those of you who come up, that's uh, George Benning's store, but some of the prices there. Yeah. That, uh, Quite a difference. Oh, this is great. There are no, no. other questions or people who want to speak. I guess is the land still there? Is it still? Nobody's ever built anything. No, no. It's it's right, uh, right James's now. house is on the, the land that uh, is right yeah. above it. Well, no, that's actually the land that uh, I love. Yeah. But uh, the driving was down the hall. And that area is over sale. This group can start a corporation and put the big bear back there. There you go. Right. Yeah. Okay. James could be the cook in between that. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I, uh, I was just wondering if you could have the recipes. Mm -hmm. it actually, the recipe was uh, put out by the company. The, all of the herbs and spices in that was came from the grocery company. So we bought that. So No, we didn't make the special recipes. We made special dressing recipes that went to the uh, great with mom there in heaven, I guess. I wonder. No, no, we've got, I just we wanted to say that. We have Thousand Island oh, dressing, yeah. Oh, that was yes. so good. Yeah, that was good. We still have that one, you can certainly have. Yeah. The Art Peel was one of the main guys that worked there when I did in 60, um, five, six, and seven. And he run the Broster most of the time. Right. And he named the Broster Big Bertha. <laughs> he always talked, oh, he had to drain the Big Bertha. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you, I sure made a mistake when I let that grease up. <laughs> Very hot and on the floor. <laughs> I remember, I don't know if there's any recipe for this, except for the new Gus and Gus's hat. Remember the butter dog? Oh, yeah, this was butter no, ice cream, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. It, was, it was a mall. Yeah. It was a mall, yeah. yeah, yeah. We called each other Gus, I'm sorry. Uh, for some reason, when we were in college, we started calling each other Gus. Uh, my grandson's name, too. But uh, anyway, we put uh, peanut butter and what else was in there? Peppermint. Peppermint. And uh, coconut. <laughs> and a little shot of orange. Uh, extract, and I don't remember what else, they, there were, there was one more ingredient though, and then the, the milk and the ice cream. Yeah. And it was good. Yeah, they were, they were good. <laughs> yeah, they only use it. Now. Did you already mention um, the first time you guys decided to stay open after the days of 76? Yeah. 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 Judy Keegan yeah. and Helen yeah. and you. Yeah. Just, okay. <laughs> that, that, that was the was staff that you yeah. thought would yeah. be plenty. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had the crazy idea that we were, we were going to have breakfast. And Mom said, you're going to have breakfast. I'm going to stay in bed. <laughs> said, okay. I didn't know how to cook breakfast, frankly. <laughs> I said, oh, we're going to get business. We're going to have all kinds of business. I remember the first day that we stayed open for breakfast, I was out there by myself. I thought, I'm not going to have too many customers. I do. But the first guy that came in said, I want a poached egg. 
okay. <laughs> and I went back and I started coming through Mom's books. That took quite a while and I finally had to go out and use outside the car. Uh, and I said, sir, could you tell me how you post <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said, forget it, just fry the thing and bring it out. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up on that one. <laughs> we catered for a while too. How long did that last? The catering. I was gone during that most of that time. We I started the catering yeah. the service uh, at the day of '76 in the, the little uh, cater trailer, uh, and then we built the other one as I was there going back and forth. But Mom and Dad did the, the catering business. I think about two years probably going out to various places and catering. It was a lot of work compared to the driving. Yeah. I worked for that one fall <coughs> yeah. on the catering. Mm -hmm. You served meals in the little grade yeah. school yeah. up by the courthouse now. Yeah. Just one thing I'll share real quick because I know we're running out of time. Uh, any of you remember the, uh, uh, I think it was called the granddaddy ice cream or the uh, grandpa ice cream? Any of you remember? I can't remember what it sold for, I'll have to look on there. But it was the ice cream cone. It was about that big around the top. A giant ice cream cone. Giant ice cream cone. And you had to uh, stand underneath the ice cream. Uh, Dwight and I were Sold for a dollar. Sold for a dollar. Yeah. And you piled just as much ice cream as you possibly could on top of it. So uh, a person would be holding the ice cream here, cone, down here, and the ice cream was about up to here. <laughs> and you couldn't push it out the window. You girls would have to walk outside very gingerly holding this ice cream, make sure it didn't fall over before they passed it to the person, who would then start eating the ice cream and see how much they could get into them before it went down on the floor. <laughs> Actually, we didn't do it the dining room. You're going to have to eat it outside if you want it. <laughs> Oh, we can stay as long as anybody wants to it and share. Any other, uh, <coughs> other questions? Yeah. My dad who remembers the fire of the catering. catering. Oh, yeah. That's how that ended. Yeah, does anybody remember the fire? Uh, oh, you mean the catering? Yeah. I remember that one very well. But, uh, yeah, the <coughs> we, had, we were working on the idea of serving banquets. Uh, and we had the idea this was partly mine, partly dead, that banquets were usually served too slow and the food was cold by the time it reached you. And so we were going on the idea that if we uh, built a, a cart that, well, actually, Dad built them, and they were plywood with wheels on, and we had slots that we could slide the, the dishes and plates uh, of the food that we were serving, it was usually steaks from the red magic cooker or the roaster uh, and we would just slide them in and then the, the boys who were serving were dressed in black and white and uh, fancy ties and all this sort of thing but it didn't last very long we did several things and then we were doing the junior miss uh, uh, program uh, when we were having junior miss and we were serving all of them the uh, girls and families and so forth in the old, what would that building be now? Uh, it's down below the Erskine building, which is not... Mm -hmm. That old grade school. The old grade school, whatever that building is now. But that's where we were serving. We were behind it uh, with the cater trailer and all the kids were inside. Anyway, the, uh, uh, I was inside and the uh, smoke started to come up and it was coming out of the French fire. And I thought, well, if I can crawl in, I was outside him, hopped into the trailer, crawled into the, uh, the trailer, underneath the uh, smoke that was coming out, and I thought, if I can just get the French fire, turn it off, then maybe it'll cool down and I'll get out of here. So anyway, I just got in there, and then the flames burst out overhead, and it caught fire. And I thought, I've got to get out of here. So I crawled under it, just barely got to the door, and evidently the propane in the lines or something um, burst and it blew me out the door. 
<laughs> so my hair was scorched. But uh, of course the trailer was, was shot. And so we, uh, we, we did, uh, we thought we've got to serve this bandwidth. So we took both of our cars and we ran up to the drive-in, cooked the food, came down and served it to them. But uh, that was the end of the case trailer. <laughs> Yeah. Jim, there's something that comes to my mind. You know, I've known about the year forever, well, ever since I got to be friends with life. But uh, the food, we go over that. The food was marvelous. It absolutely could not be duplicated again. And the folks were great and whatnot. But you know what comes through? You folks had so many ideas. <laughs> you were just thinking all the time. They were good ideas. Isn't that something? Some crazy. <laughs> pretty good. That's all. <laughs> Were your chickens delivered to you by somebody, or did you have to go to town and buy the uh, chickens? We went to, well, actually, some were delivered. And I was trying to think of the store in Deadwood. Twin City. Twin City. There you go. Twin City. Yeah. Uh, when we started getting chicken the very first time, I think we got one or two cases. Uh, we thought that's going to take care of it. <laughs> well, it wasn't very long before we were getting dozens of cases uh, coming in trying to have enough chicken on hand to be able to do it. And then we frequently couldn't uh, guess what it was going to be because the business was growing so fast and so we were running down to the Super Duper or up to Deadwood to get more chickens so that we had them. So we were back and forth all the time. But we tried to guess on how much. Uh, a lot of chickens. <laughs> Gus, Gus and I were having a contest with how fast uh, we could uh, decapitate a chicken, or, or cut up a chicken, I should say. That's how I cut my finger. <laughs> <laughs> I still got the scar. <laughs> I believe it. You had to haul me down to Dr. Jones. That's so right. Yeah, yeah, we were really going that. About, about midnight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he had one cleaver and I had another one with a big mom's knife was about that long. It was like a machete. <laughs> because she had come to chickens before we started out. So we had a contest. Chickens came whole. Yeah, yeah. 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 cut them up in pieces. Cut the wings yeah. off, cut the legs yeah. off, yeah. Yeah. split the breast, yeah. cut the thighs, yeah. and then toss them in the brine yeah. to yeah. marinate overnight. Yeah. 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 That was it. Yeah. That was fun. Incidentally, Gus has the, Dwight has the record of driving down Boulder Canyon. Uh, he always said that he hooked his wheel on the edge of one particular piece of concrete so it wouldn't throw him off the road as he was running down to Court County. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Did you picture Jerry Cider? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jerry Cider, I forgot that. Yeah, yeah there was a place in. Where was it? Hill City? Hill City. Hill City. Sold, yeah, Hill City. City. sold some delicious cherry cider. And they wouldn't get the recipe away. I don't I don't like them. And so we we were in there mixing and mixing and mixing. I got all kinds of different flavors and extracts to see how we were gonna make the, the best cherry cider. I don't think we ever duplicated theirs quite, but we did do it. But um, I I got to sick of cherry cider before we finally got the recipe. Yeah, yeah that was another idea. I was a salesman for Twin Cities at the time, and I used to sell them okay. supplies to make the cherry cider. Ah, sure. Uh, no wonder you know. Alma Bike was our next boss. Uh, we sold to them. Oh, was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Carlson. they the ones that bought the drive-in? Carlston was your name. Carlston. Carlston. They were the ones that bought it? Carlston. Yeah, Carlston. Carlston. Yeah. Carlston. Yeah. Carlston. Yeah. She okay. was a bike. Okay, and they bought it? Alfred and... They bought, they bought the big bear. Oh, I see. Oh, I, I was so gone, some so I didn't still know. still work there under them. Was I right in how it, how it burned? I thought so. You know, I wasn't working there when oh. it burned, oh. but I did work for her for a while. So. And I was married in 71, and never we never worked there again. I didn't. So. I think that's what happened. That's what Mom and Dad told me. Yeah. yeah. Well, they would know. Yeah. They got a liquor license and convert the, the uh, dining room to drink some. Yeah. 
And, and th my sister did work there at that time because yeah. she worked for Alma too. And yeah. I think Doris probably said if the water comes, just send them home. Because you know, yeah. I remember the 72 flood, they all came home. Yeah. But yeah, And I would guess it was then that in 72 that it burned. No, no, it, it was 75, 76, 7, somewhere around right there. It was yeah. like yeah, 75. Because Bruce Walker, I worked for him and started working for him in 74. And, it was, still and, and it was still there because he took us out for dinner. It was oh, Twyla. Okay. okay. Well, they must have was been there. longer than that then. So it was it was I mean, after seventy four for sure. About seventy six. I was just guessing on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can remember. Mm -hmm. She has a question for James. Oh sure. So with all the stories, did they miss anything? Did you miss anything? Probably, but I'm not going to remember them all now. I don't no, know. I want to hear now. James' version. Oh, James, sure. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I think we've hit a lot of them. And, uh, you know, it's one thing that I think about, you know, you talk about Grandma and Grandpa, but, you know, my fondest memory is that Grandma, she was just such a giver and always wanted to serve. And so, just growing up, even after with no drive-in, but she, if you came over to her house, it was like a big deal, and she wanted to serve and work. And for years and years, she worked for Maddie Newcomb and would bring her meals three times a day. That was just kind of her nature, you know. And so, probably a lot of that rubbed off with the relationships here with the people in this room, and, and that was just how she was wired, for sure. <coughs> Did uh, I knew Maddie. Did she work on the ranch? No, I don't. She lived uh, a block up. So, uh, that, that's after they moved to town. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody recall the shootout at the Big Bear Drive-In? No. It's not one of your Do you remember it? No. There was the shootout at the OK Corral in Tombstone Road. The Big Bear Drive-In had a shootout. Uh, I, I, there's got to be somebody in here that remembers that. It was it, it hit the newspapers. Well, there was two of our law illustrious law enforcement officers in the state in Sturgis, and they were always playing pranks and doing crazy things. Probably some of these guys remember what I'm talking about. Anyhow, they drove in. They had the police car. They drove into the Big Bear Drive-In with the light on and the siren on, and one guy got out and started running. A, a guy, a person jumped out of the police car and started running, and the driver of the police car got out and boom, boom. Oh. And uh, there was people in the drive-in and sitting outside. <laughs> you don't remember this? No, I was there. Uh, we probably were. I bet you were gone. Yeah. I bet you were gone. <laughs> Nobody Montana. else remembers this? Anyhow, there was so much excitement, they didn't realize that the guy that was shot got up and got back in the police car and drove off. <laughs> 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 Who did that? <laughs> Are they still living? No. Well, they're both dead. <laughs> 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 there's Bill Perry and George Smith. <laughs> 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 Bill Perry and George Smith. Bill Perry and George Smith. Bill Perry and George Smith. That would have been in... Uh, I'm going to say about 67 or 68. Yeah, uh, they, they had it written up in the newspaper. <laughs> I wish I could find the date because we could find the article in the newspaper. But nobody, nobody here remembers that, huh? Boy, that was crazy. They got into a little trouble. I think they got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> In fact, that was the headlines shootout at the Big Bear. <laughs> oh, we've got it. Uh, I'd like to find that article. <laughs> it was in the paper, so I can just, I can't really, I'm trying to think of she I read worked in 65, 66, and 67. 
So it was after that. Probably around 70 maybe. Thank you all for your memories that you shared.